Hallelujah. As we are we uh, is it ready? Okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Sometimes I have those mental lapses. Thank y'all so much. But um, turn with me to the book of Daniel. Turn with me to the book of Daniel. We're gonna come in on the midst of a confrontation. In Daniel 13, three and 13, it reads, then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave a command to bring Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying to them, is it true Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that you, do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I've set up. Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the mist of a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you on this matter. If that is the case, our God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But I want you to pay attention to this verse. This is the power verse. This is the I'm all in verse. But if not, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image that you've set up. I'll fight you on this. I'll fight you. I'll fight you on this. I'll fight you till you take my life. There has to come a time when you've made up your mind that I'll, I'll fight you on this right here. There's no more compromising. There, there's no more in and out. There's no more trying to get along. There's no more appeasement. I'll fight you on this one. David asked, is there not a cause? Because when he walked up in Samuel, he saw that the entire army that he loved and the king that he loved and his big brothers and everyone standing behind rocks, afraid as this uncircumcised heathen cursed God and the people of God. And Daniel says, listen, I know you're scared, but is there not a cause? The church needs to wake up and understand right today that there has to be a cause where you determine that I'll fight you on this one. I'll fight you if I ain't got a friend left. I'll fight you if you don't want to call me no more. That's all right, but I'm going to fight on this right here because this boils down to God and the devil. There are so many things now that we're confronted with that we try to compromise and sweep under the rug and try to put a better face on it, but it comes down to God and the devil. Yeah. David says, no, I might not have what you think I ought to have to fight, but I got God in my heart. I got a relationship with the Lord. Yeah. You might look at me and feel like that, yeah, 
I am not equipped enough and I'm too young and I'm too weak and I don't have and I'm not this and I'm not that. But that's all right. I'm bringing the fight to you. The Bible says that he didn't wait on Goliath. The Bible says he ran to him. I'm going to fight you. I want you to know that I'm going to fight you. I'm not going to talk you to death. I'm going to fight you on this. I'm going to fight you on this. What is the cause? What, what is it now that we're waiting for? In, in the church today, what are we waiting for? Have we not compromised enough? Have we not, have we not gone through too many things trying to look like the world and trying to make the world like us and they still don't like us because they're not supposed to like us because we are not of them. We are of God. They can't understand us. They don't understand the foolishness of our, 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 our preaching. They don't understand the faith that we walk by. So why is it now that we're trying to find a partnership of somebody who despises us because they despise our God. Oh, it's not personal. It's not about you. It's about the Jesus in you. If you want to find a, 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 some type of God image, they'll be all right with you. There are a whole lot of people out here will declare today that I'm spiritual. Yeah. I worry about them more so because I don't know what kind of spirit they're carrying with them. No, David says, no, no, there has to be a cause. There has to be a point where this demonic depression, I mean, demonic aggression is confronted. Let me tell you something right now. We trying to pray devils away. God says, confront that devil and I'll, I'll win for you. Listen to what I'm saying. Confront that, whatever it is, confront that issue. And I'll give you power over that issue. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to, but confront it. God is not going to conquer what you are afraid to confront. There is a growth process that's involved in this, and we miss it sometimes. That's why that verse 18 is so important. <coughs> that's why that is so important, because we miss the power of the growth, glory to God. There's a scripture, and I'm not going to tell you to, uh, to go there, but there is a scripture, and we're all familiar with it. When You know, the first time that they were in a storm, and they cried, and Jesus was sleeping in the boat. And they were crying, and don't you, don't you care about us? Don't you care we about to die? Don't you care you laying there asleep? And he got up and he spoke to the winds and the waves. But there were many storms after that. And the growth that took place and the fight that took place was a fight of obedience in the midst of the storm. When Jesus went to the mountains to pray and he told them that evening that go to the other side and they fought, they fought the winds and the waves. What was supposed to be a two hour journey, six hours later, they were still caught up in the middle. Can't get to the other side, but refusing to go back. I'll fight because Jesus said, meet him over there. I'll fight because Jesus already told me what he'll do for me. I'll fight and I got to go where Jesus told me to be so I can get what he told me I can have, amen. I'll fight, I'll fight the storm. I'm not scared of this storm no more, glory to God, because I got my mind on what I need to accomplish right now. I'll fight. You need to let the devil know that I'm not only I'm not tired yet, I'll fight you. I'll fight you. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about, look, yeah, I, everybody doesn't have a, a loud voice, glory to God. And, and some of y'all would not believe my personality if you knew me personally. I am not an openly loud, extroverted person that likes to go out in the public and talk loud to people. That's not who I am. But when it comes to God and the things of Jesus Christ, I cannot allow the quiet key to sit back and not pronounce for somebody to hear who God is. See, sometimes the fight has to begin way, way, way deep down in your personality. And you got to tell yourself that I can't be who I normally am because I got to fight this devil. I can't be quiet now. I can't be, I can't be peaceful now. I, I can't just be, be, be the one that tries to make peace with everybody now. I, I, can't, I can't do that right now. I have to fight my personality to stand up for what God has shown me that he would have me to do. I have to stand up and speak that thing that might not be popular. I have to stand 
end up when everybody turns and say, man, you done lost your mind. But that's all right. I'll be crazy for Jesus because he saved me from the craziness of my former self. He saved me from the craziness of how I was living. He saved me from my craziness that was about to destroy me. He saved me from myself. So I give myself over to him. Talk to me. Talk to me. Can I get a witness in here? I fight. I got to fight sometimes. That, that feeling that makes me want to say it's not my battle. And that was the thing that I, I, I can't remember the wordings of it. I wish I would have wrote it down. But the man, it's a long, long thing. And it started out when they came for the Jews, I, I said nothing. And when they came, he went down every group of persons that the Nazis came for, and he opened not his mouth. Until one day, he says, they came for me. See, we can sit around and act like it ain't my fight until it's your child or your grandchild. You can sit around and act like it ain't your fight until it's your mama or your daddy. You can sit around and act like it ain't your fight until you watch those that you love get slaughtered in the street. You can act like it ain't your fight because it has not showed up at your door yet, but it's got your address already. You think that everything is going well now and just because it's going well, that's going to always go well. No, you got to make sure that the house is covered in the blood of the lamb. You got to make sure. And even with the blood of the lamb, there are some demons that will sneak in, glory to God. They'll sneak in on them ideas and them thoughts you had. And you got to put them out in the name of Jesus. You can't feel good about it because ain't nobody around. You can't feel good about it because your integrity is not questioned by the crowd. You have to make sure that you understand that this fight is 20 Four seven, because the enemy will come at you in the middle of the night. The enemy will come at you. Glory to God. You can be sitting in church. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I know the times that I've been on my face praying and the enemy comes and attacks me while I'm praying to God. He is no respecter, just like God ain't. The devil don't care nothing about you praying. He's going to send a distraction. He's going to send a thought. He's going to send something to try to derail you. Glory to God. This message, I still don't know how it was going to come together because it came from different thoughts and ideas. But God showed me, he asked me, he said, are you tired? The news that comes up on your phone, the news that's on the paper, in the paper, the news, are you tired? And I said, yes, but what can I do? He said, fight. Fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Every time you look in something, Pray about it. Put some prayer on it. Put some prayer on it. Don't give nothing over to the devil. Put some prayer on it. Put some prayer on it, glory to God, that it won't continue like that. You have to declare that I'm tired of this mess and I don't care. I don't care who's offended. I don't care who is offended. I could care less about who's offended when I'm stepping up for God's truth. Come on now. See, because I'm not interested in what the world calls facts, but because the facts of the world are lies now. I said the facts of the world are intermingled with lies now. And ever since the fall of man, the things that come up out of man have always had a devilish connotation to them because the devil was invited in, amen? And from that time on, man was prone to tell a lie. I got a good whale over there because don't nobody want to stand because the truth of the matter is we're going to have to stand in opposition to the world's facts. Glory to God. We're going to have to stand in opposition in various times and various trials and tribulations that we go through. We're going to have to stand. And I'm not talking about just standing there and with your arms folded and standing there and saying, well, I don't really have anything to do with this. And, and I wish that everybody know I'm going to stand and, 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 and declare that God is here because he lives in me. I'm going 
understand it. Oh, wait a minute. How can you say that? Because I am saved and born again. Glory to God. And the Holy Spirit has decided to come and dwell in me. And wherever I go, he is in me. So I'm standing in the middle of your mess. And I'm declaring that the power of God is going to take over this mess. I'm declaring that God will change the narrative. I'm declaring that God will bring about a change. I'm declaring that the devil's work will not complete itself. I'm declaring that God will move in a way that we don't understand it. I'm, I'm, I'm declaring it even though I don't see it because I have to walk by faith and not by what? It's not easy. But it begins with how we value salvation. Yeah. Yeah. How we value salvation will determine at what point we will fight. Who do I like best? Let me tell you something right now. This made, this made no sense to me when I wrote it down. I don't know if it was last week whenever I found this little piece of paper, but some people don't value their salvation enough to walk upright after they've been healed. Let me, let, me share, let me show you what I'm saying. I'm not talking about trying to do everything right all the time. Now, I know we missed the mark. Glory to God, I understand what that is. But I'm talking about we will walk with a spiritual limp even though we have been saved and healed. We'll get around some people and spiritually start limping because they are used to our being broke. They are used to our limping. They are used to our brokenness. So we don't want to stand upright and walk strong and walk tall in front of them because we're afraid of what they might think of us. How much do you value your salvation? How much do you value your salvation? God delivered you from that, I don't know, years ago, years ago, and you still limping when you get around certain people. You still limping when you get around certain people, spiritually limping when certain people come around because you can't declare that I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed by the blood of Jesus. I'm healed. Listen, it's not throwing off on them. It's telling them how they can get healed. It's telling them that the same God that delivered me will deliver you. But if they keep seeing you limp every time they see you, come on now. See, there's a big difference in hypocrisy and diplomacy. I, I have to be everything to everybody that I might win some. But I don't have to be who you are in order to impress you. See, you used to me cussing. You used to me cussing. So every time I get around you, I let two or three slip just to let you know that I'm still one of you. Come on, come on. How much do you value? That's the fight, baby. That's the fight. That's the fight. That's the fight. You used to me cussing, so I let two or three slip just to let you know. Not no big ones, just little ones. I let them slip just to let you know I'm still one of you. I'm still one of you. Yeah, that's the fight. That's the fight. And they start talking about what they're doing, and you start talking about what you used to do with them. That's the fight. Because now you're limping so that you'll be accepted. You're limping so that, that, that you'll look like what they remember you by instead of standing up and let them see what God has made you to be. You got to fight. You got to fight. You got to fight. Glory to God. Glory to God. Because in this world we live in today, God's truth, God's truth and man's fact are, are, are being confronted with one another every day, every day, every day. And now they're trying to take God's truth and put it in politics. And now they're trying to take God's truth. Oh, come on, somebody. They're taking God's truth. They're trying, to, they're trying to water down God's truth to mandate whatever it is that they want. But the truth is in the word of God. I said the truth is in the word of God. The truth is in the word of God. Amen. And anything that anybody adds to it, I feel sorry for their soul on judgment day. And anything that somebody tries to take away from it, because the Bible says you shall not add or subtract one tittle. This is our fight. See, because there comes a time when you can't have it both ways. Sometimes you have to say, you know what? It's not only my God, but it's my self-respect. I say, listen, it's not prideful to be a self-respecting Christian. 
Somebody has taught us something opposite, that we got to be these little things that hold our heads down and everybody talking, we looking at the ground. Look, I'm gonna look you straight in the eye and I'm gonna tell you you a lie. Yeah. I'm gonna look you straight in the eye and tell you what you talking is nonsense. And then I'm going to tell you, you need to step back away from me and give me some arm's length because I don't want you that close to me. Because I got to let you know that I serve a God that's given me my self-respect back. Come on, somebody. God has given me my self-respect back. When I got saved, my self-respect became uh, 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 important to, to the Holy Spirit to teach me how to respect myself again. Because otherwise, I would have been drowning in the old me. I would have been drowning and wallowing in what I used to be. Glory to God. But as they, we, we, we are taking this thing now and not understanding that that's not a prideful move to be a self-respecting, say self-respecting self child of God. That's what the enemy wants to attack. He wants to, he wants to make you feel like that, that, that who you are is not enough. And unless you are a part of this group and unless you do that and unless you agree with this and unless you do with that, unless you, uh, no, he has nothing to do with your relationship with your God. As we come together, as we come together collectively, it means nothing unless you got a personal relationship with God. It means nothing collectively getting a group of people together. Is, it means nothing unless we are, are one individually in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. See, we don't understand sometimes that we think that just because we got issues, we're not going to come under attack. We think that because we're going through something now, we're not going to be attacked. We think some kind of way that I'm going to be immune until I get better. That's what we talk ourselves into. And that's why we, that's when we start to compromise. And that's when you better fight all the more. See, sometimes in our natural bodies, when we're going through stuff and fever is coming out in us and we're thrashing and things are going on in our bodies and we're not, we're feeling horrible. The body is fighting. The body is fighting against things that are, that are trying to take it down. The body is fighting the germs and, and all the things that's trying to attack it. It's fighting. And our flesh only feels the part where the fight is taking place. The flesh doesn't even understand how the inside is fighting to keep that stuff from going any deeper inside. You got to fight when you hurt. You got to fight when you cry. You got to fight while you grieving. You got to fight. Come on, somebody. You got to fight because it's in the times of grief. It's in the times of suffering. It's in the times when your heart is broke. When the enemy say, I got you now. We can't bow to public opinion and expect to achieve what God has for us. Amen. We can't take unsaved attitudes and make them equal with our own attitudes. Listen to what I'm saying. I said, make them equal. You don't know how blessed you are. And you bring, you bring in these unsaved opinions and attitudes into your life like they mean something. These unsaved opinions and attitudes, because they've got a little money. They're going to die and go to hell. All right? They go, they're going to die and go to hell. You're sitting there because they got a nice car. You're sitting there because so many people flock around and you're sitting there because they've received some kind of fame and prestige. So you allow, you allow these, these unsaved images and these unsaved attitudes and these unsaved opinions to come and challenge your opinion and cause you to think twice about the life that God has given you, causing you to think twice about the decisions that you've made to serve Jesus. You're thinking twice about who you're around and what you ought to do with your time and your money and your life. You're thinking twice all behind the attitudes and the opinions of some unsaved person because on the outside they look like, but let me tell you something, they are the ones that typically want to blow their own brains out after a minute. In Daniel, 
They were bought there as slaves. Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego. were bought there as slaves. And when they came there, their names were Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And the first thing the conqueror wants to do is to change your name. They told Daniel, your name is Belteshazzar. They wanted to give them all Aramaic names. The devil has always tried to give you a name that attached you to your sinful life. The devil tried to give you a name that attached you to your crazy family. The devil never attached you to the church going family members. The devil never gave you a name with the successful people in your life. Nobody ever said you act just like the, the ones that go to church and the ones that went to school and the ones that did what they were supposed to. Nobody in your family ever said that to you. They'll find the fools and say you act just like yo. Nobody ever says you, you remind me of, of how the one that, that made good grades and, and the one that kept themselves and the one that fought against injustice and the one that tried to do right. Nobody ever tells you that. You just like that drunk. You just like that one that got high all the time. You just like that lying, cheating dog. You just like, they're going to always tell you. <laughs> They're going to give you something that ain't yours. And if you're not careful, you'll slide back into it when you start limping around them friends again. Because they'll start telling you just how crazy you are. No, that's how crazy I was. That's how crazy I was. Oh, you ain't changed, man. You ain't changed. Yes, I have. See, because who you're talking to right now ain't even that same person. See, I've been born again. I've been bought with a price. I'm not my own. I belong to the Lord now. And what you're looking at might look similar to what it is, but I'm not running on the same fuel. I don't have the same fuel. I don't have the same blood. I don't have the same lineage. I don't have the same destiny. I don't have the same thoughts. I don't have the same ambition that I used to have because I belong to Christ now. And when you try to take that away, my salvation means more to me than anything in this world. So I'll fight you. I'll fight you. Daniel 3 begins with an image. We're surrounded by images every day. Those devices that you call phone, they keep on pumping images and pumping images and pumping images. And, and I thought it was supposed to be about looking at what you look at and uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Help me out. The term that where they look at what you're looking at and they send you I'm 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 freaking out here. I, I'm lost, I've lost, I had a thought. Yeah. Yeah. Well they well you um clicking on certain things, so they, they're tracking what you're clicking on. I'm trying to think of the term. BJ help me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and, and what it does is it's supposed to bring you information that you're interested in. But but what they do, what they do, it's not analytics. Um, but what they're doing is they're 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 still trying to slide something in. Okay, well, I can't pronounce all that. That's all right. I figured out everybody know what I'm talking about. But the bottom line is the images that they're going to send you, it was surprising to me when I started looking up other churches and messages by other pastors. Because what they would send me is I scroll up and there's a pastor in a church, and I scroll up and there's a pastor in a church, and then I scroll up and there's something right there. I was like, whoa, where'd that come from? We're confronted with 
images all the time. We're confronted with images all the time. And now these images make you make a decision of what image you are. Yeah. Algorithms. Thank you. Thank you. I was about to lose my mind over that word. These algorithms are supposed to, according to what put you in a place to where like-minded stuff, because they're supposed to look at what you have been searching and what you've been looking for. And they're supposed to bring you content that's, that's on that level that might interest you. But the devil always has an image. He's going to see, let me see if you can this. Because the first time, the first time that I was watching this thing and I'm watching uh, churches and, and then there's an image after this church and I listened to a message after the church and it flipped and the next image came up with women with, with tape on their bodies, not even clothes. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I ain't never asked for this because there's an image. Let me see if you'll still fall down and worship. Come on, somebody. I saw some, I heard something somebody say the other day. They said that people will not pay anything, any attention that don't interest them. But if you get a naked person to walk down the street, everybody will stop and look. <laughs> a child can be crying. A woman could be begging for food. A man could be laying on the sidewalk and everybody walks about doing their business, but you get a naked person, don't have to be an attractive naked, just a naked person. Walk down the street and everybody will stop and pay attention. We're surrounded by images and those images are supposed to influence you because this is what Nebuchadnezzar had in mind when he spent all his time and money to create an image to make sure that they worship him. These certain segments of society have created images and you can't be a part of it until you fall down. Either you fall down or you be talked about. Either you fall down and you be ostracized. We used to hear about peer pressure. Peer pressure doesn't stop at 50. Peer pressure don't stop at 60. Peer pressure don't stop at 70. There's a certain age you get to and you mess around and start going back and thinking these younger people are your peers. Well, you're supposed to be teaching them because of the images that make you fall down. Oh, come on now. I'm talking about the images that make you want to fall down. Ah, everybody needs to check their self and the value of your salvation. What image makes you want to fall down? When I was a young man in my late teens, we could go to a Cheech and Chong movie. I know I'm dating. I know some people don't even understand what Cheech and Chong are. They think it's some kind. Of, I know they won't even know what the Cheech and Chong is. But Cheech and Chong movies were all about drugs. And we would just laugh would just laugh because those were the images in our life at that time that would make us fall down because those people that I knew that did not get high didn't find it funny same image don't work on everybody I said the same image don't work on everybody because see there are some people glory to God that 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 can see porn and, and they are drawn to it. There are some people that see porn and they don't, I, man, I, I'm not interested in that. It don't make me fall down. There are some people that can, can listen to somebody talk about money so long that before you know it, they'll talk you out of your money trying to show you how to get money. You'll fall down to it because you want that money so bad. These are the images that we're facing today. These are the images that try to take away your dignity because see what it's going to do. It's meant to take away your dignity. It's not trying to build you up. It's not to build you up. It's to enslave you by stripping away your dignity and your self-esteem and how you look at yourself. Because once your self-esteem is taken away, they know they've got you then. 
Women, girls, anytime you're in a relationship and a man tries to strip away who you are and the value of who you are, you hurry up and get away from that fool. And brothers, the same thing. Anytime a woman got to sit up and call you all kind of dirty names to tell you what you ain't and how you ain't going to never have nothing and be nothing, you need to turn around and say, well, ain't no sense in me being here. What in the world you want with me if I ain't going to never be nothing? What do you want with me if I ain't going to never have nothing? What do you want with me if I'm the sorriest thing in the world? I need to get away from you. Amen? It's going to strip away your dignity and your self-esteem. Tell him don't close that door like that no more. Let me tell you something right now. See, that's just how the enemy works to try to send a distraction to me. I don't understand what all the movement is about, but that's a distraction that the enemy was trying to send to me. But in Daniel 8, we know the images have been set. We know the king has made a decree. But it says, therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. The Kisiophas. They're going to speak to someone who's an authority. See, this is when you have to determine how important your salvation is. Who is an authority over you? Listen to what I'm saying. Who do you give authority over you? I was taught growing up. I worked for a living. I didn't work for a company. I was taught that I worked for my family. I don't work for a boss. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Whose authority? See, because now let me tell you something. I took some stuff. Because the people who raised me showed me that you're going to have to put up with some stuff. If you love your family. You're going to have to put up with some stuff. You're going to have to take some stuff. If you love your family, it ain't about this boss. It ain't about that job. It ain't about any of that. But you have to determine what am I working for? You have to determine that. Because then you can cut out who has authority over you. You determine at that moment who has authority over you. See, because now they're going to put the pressure on and say, well, wait a minute. They go on down here in 12 and says that, that there are certain Jews whom, whom uh, you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. There are certain Jews. There are people that you have, you have elevated to certain places of importance. There are certain people and, and, and they're not like us. See, there are certain people now within the leadership of the company that, that we can't tell those kind of jokes anymore. There are certain people now that, that, that are of color, so now we can't act like that anymore. We have to hide who we are. There are, there are, there are women in these positions now, so we can't talk, tell those little dirty jokes and nasty jokes anymore. There, there are some people that, that you put in position. See, Nebuchadnezzar didn't put them in position because he liked them. He put them in position because he needed them. But you need to understand that there's a message inside of you that scares the devil as he's trying to message you. He's trying to give you a message to scare you, but he's so scared, of, he's scared of your message because you have a message to set the captives free. You have the message to let somebody know that they don't have to live under the thumb of Satan anymore. You have a message inside of you that he is afraid of, glory to God. And then let me tell you something about this business world. And let me tell you something about the unsaved world. They need you. Don't ever go into a situation and think that, well, I'm only here because I'm saved. No, you there because you are better than everybody else. Why is it so hard for us to feel like that we are better than the rest of these people? I know how to do my job better than the rest of them. That's why I'm here. We talk ourselves into a, a meekness that God didn't require from us. If God has anointed you, if God has given you knowledge, if God has trained you, if God has given you a talent, don't dumb it down to try to get along with people. I've had jobs where I have made them so mad and then they wish they could have just said, good to go home. 
But if I go home, who's going to run this? Because the only people that can run it after I leave are the people that I train. And they still call me and ask me what to do. Somebody better hear me in here today. Y'all don't understand the value of who God made you. And it's that value that makes the devil mad. Nebuchadnezzar went in a rage because things didn't go his way. And he says, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I've set up? And now he says to them, he says, listen, if you are ready, if you're ready now, get yourself together. Get yourself together now. I know you went through a little, a little issue in life. Go on and get over your little Jesus moment. That's what the world will try to tell you. Go on and get over your little Christian moment. Come on back to the reality of the world that you live in. He says, if you're ready now. At the time you hear the sound of the horn, the harp, the flute, the lyre, and the psaltery and symphony with all kinds of other music. I'm giving you a chance to get yourself ready. I'm giving you an opportunity to be my slave. I'm giving you another opportunity. This is what I'm saying. I'm giving you the golden opportunity of a lifetime to fall down because I say so. See, we many times don't realize how many threats that bring about fear in our heart because somebody's offering us another chance that we didn't even ask for. Because you get tired of being by yourself. You get tired of the struggle that you're going through. And the enemy gives you one more chance to come and fall. The enemy will ask you, are you tired of being lonely? Well, when the music comes on on Friday evening, and when the phone starts ringing, I'll give you another opportunity to fall. I'm going to keep giving you an opportunity to fall because I want your talent. I want your talent to worship me. I want your knowledge to be under my thumb. Satan has no power to do the things that you can do. He doesn't have the power because God has given you power that he didn't give him. Man. Satan doesn't have an imagination. Satan can't create anything. But you can. And he wants that. So I'm going to give you another opportunity to fall. But here's the threat. If you don't, it's going to get hot. And now you got to get to the place of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and say, you know what? You might as well save your breath, man. You might as well save your breath. There's no sense in us talking about that. I've made up my mind. Can I hear somebody say, I got a made up mind? I got a made up mind. You're just sitting there wasting your breath on me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, look here, we don't even need to answer you on this right here. We've already told you. See, we, we need to let somebody know, man, I ain't even trying to listen to that. Jesus has been too good to me. I am born again. I am born again. I don't need to hear nothing about all of this flippy tricky new stuff you got going on. I don't care where you saw it on the internet. I don't care who wrote it. I don't care what school they supposed to went through. I don't care nothing about that. Don't even entertain that nonsense around me. I belong to Jesus. Man. I belong to Jesus. Yeah, I thank you, but I don't need you to help me fall. See, somebody needs to understand that, that, that I can fall all on my own. I don't need an invitation to fall. I need Jesus to help keep me upright. I need Jesus to keep me, keep me standing, all right? Amen? Glory to God. 
So we're going to turn it up on you. We're going to threaten to make things even harder. We're going to threaten. The devil will threaten you with your health. He'll threaten your family. He'll threaten your, your income. He'll threaten the place that you live. He'll threaten to turn it up on you to see if he can make you fall. That's all he wants you to do is to fall before him one time. That's all he told Jesus when he took him over to the He said, if you'll worship me, I'll give you all of this right here. If you worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. If that's all I want you to do is fall down one time. I want everybody to see you fall. I want everybody to see you worship me. I want everybody to see you give in to what I say. I want everybody to see because that way your voice will be silenced. That way your testimony will be void. That way nobody will pay attention when you start. You will be like Lot, glory to God. Can't even convince your own family to come out before God destroys everything. He said, look, I don't know who this God is, but you in my hand. And they say, yeah, not so. Not so. If that's the case, our God whom we serve. This is why, this is why a lot of Christians don't get to this place. It says, the God we serve. I didn't say ask for stuff. I didn't say pray to. Come on. The God we serve. So you won't know how to fight unless you serve God. He says the God we serve is able to deliver us from the, from the burning fiery furnace. And he'll deliver us from your hand. Okay, but the power is, if not, I'm just going to read this in my translation. But if God don't do it the way I said he's going to do it, you need to know that I will not fall before you, nor I will, will I worship whatever you got. I will not fall. I will not give up. I will not give in. Because if I don't get the happy ending, if I don't get the happily ever after, if I don't get the ending that I expected to get, if things don't work out according to my plan, I still trust God. If things don't look right, I still trust God. See, these are the victories that set up seeing Jesus in the fire. These are the victories that set it up for God to come and meet you in the fire. You're wondering why I don't never see God in the storm. I don't never see God in the fire because you don't serve him and you don't keep serving him even when they're trying to turn up the heat on you. If you stand there and say, you know what? I don't care how it ends. I know I'm going to be with Jesus. I don't care how it works out. I know I'm going to end up with God. To be absent from this body will be present with the Lord. I don't care how you say it's going to end. My God has got me. My God saved me. My God delivered me. And if he don't deliver me from this right here, I know I'll gain strength behind it. I know I'll get better because of it. I know God has got me. Amen. So right now I declare that I'll fight you. Amen. I'll fight you in the name of Jesus. You bring your fire. You bring your guard. You bring your devil. You bring all your nonsense that you want because I'm going to stand here and fight. Glory to God. I will not nod my head in agreement. I will not go along to get along. I am going to fight. Somebody say, I'll fight. I'm not tired yet. I'm not tired yet. You can't threaten me. Jesus said in Matthew 10 and 28, he says, don't you feel that one that can take your, 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 your life? He says, you better feel that one that can take your life and condemn your soul to hell. That's the one. That's the one right there. Because the devil can only threaten you with so much because Jesus took the key. Jesus took the key. Jesus took the key. So when I leave this earth, I'll be in the presence of the Lord. I don't even have to go to that place that used to be called paradise. I'll be in the presence of the Lord. Jesus didn't back down from the fight. Jesus didn't back down 
He said, we're going to kill you. He said, okay. I know. Bring it. So we're going to we're going to kill you with the most excruciating, excruciating, embarrassing method known to man. He said, I know. He said, it started with a tree and I'm going to end it with a tree. Amen. Come on. He said, you deceive at the tree. And I'm going to deliver on the tree. That every curse. And even the letter of the law will be nailed. I'm going to fight you. Amen. And his disciples didn't understand because this is not the happy ending we had planned. This is not the happily ever after we had planned. And he said, what you don't get is you're not going to have the happily ever after right now. you got to lose this earthly body and let me call you back up. And then we'll come back and we'll reign and rule for all eternity. It can't, you can't have happily ever after as long as you are prone to sin. He kept fighting. As we grow into our communion service, I'm telling you today, you have to keep fighting. You have to continue in your fight, your personal fight. Your fight is personal. Your fight is personal. And you're going to have to determine that I'm not tired yet. I'm not tired yet. I got knocked down. I got stumped. And you look at me like I'm a loser because I ain't got what everybody else got. But God has promised me more than my eyes has ever seen. Amen. He said that he's going to give me exceedingly and abundantly more than I can think or ask. So what you say is success. Don't move the needle in my life anymore. I'll fight you. I'll fight you. I'll fight you because my Jesus was a fighter. Yes. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. Amen.